So anyone who's familiar with TV antennas might recognize that. That is a Channel Master 4 bay antenna and it works great but in this video I'm going to make a homemade antenna and replace that. So as I said my plan is to replace the Channel Master antenna with a, a new homemade antenna. Uh, for that I'm going to go with a gray Hooverman design. Now I should say there's nothing wrong with the Channel Master antenna I have. Um, it worked perfectly fine. I'm just curious if I could build and design a better antenna. So that's what I'm going to do. Um, so first off, in my particular area, um, if my house is located here, all the TV channels are located, broadcast from the same location up on a hill. It's about eight miles away, and we have direct line of sight. I can get all of these channels easily. There is, however, one channel much further down, like 40 miles away at 120 degrees off and it's very hard to do a single antenna to pick these two up at the same time so I'm actually going to, I'm going to build a, a gray Hooverman antenna to pick up all these and then I'm going to do a second video on a second homemade antenna uh, a Yagi antenna cut specifically to this channel down here and then try gaining, gaining the two together to see if that allows me to get the, the signal reliably on all these channels. But for the, the Gray Hoover antenna, we're just dealing with all these up here. <clears throat> now, the question is, you know, I, I personally believe that I'm going to be able to build a better antenna than the Channel Master antenna. Uh, now, the Channel Master 4 bay antenna, it's a proven workhorse. It is a very good antenna. And so, you know, what makes me feel that I can design a better antenna than that? and it actually comes down to several different things. Um, first off is just kind of design materials. You know, Channel Master, when they're building that antenna, they're mass producing them, they need to keep costs down, so they will cut corners on materials, they'll use lesser expensive steel and things like that, whereas my antenna, I'm going with all aluminum, so I can use higher quality materials because I don't really care if this one antenna costs more, you know, I'm not trying to mass produce them, so I'm fine with the cost coming down. Um, second one is kind of design restrictions. The engineer channel master who designed that antenna, you know, he, he could design the ideal antenna. Um, it may come out to be, you know, four feet by five feet in size, and marketing department's going to come to him and say, hey, we can't market and sell an antenna that size. People want a smaller antenna. So you need to redesign the antenna, get it down smaller in size. And they can do that, but when they do that, they're, they're making compromises in the design. So it won't perform as well as it could so that they could be able to sell the antenna. So those design compromises um, are, you know, kind of hinder that design. Whereas my antenna, I could care less if it comes out rather large in certain areas you know I, I'm going to design it the way I want it and I could care less about the size and the materials so that again is another reason why I feel I could do that. The last reason I feel I can design and build a better antenna than the Channel Master antenna has to do with uh, UHF itself. So when UHF was first created they allocated channels 14 through 83 now that was a long time ago I think it was in the like 60s when they did that and then in 1983 the FCC cut out a lot of the upper channels and they brought it down to channels 14 through 69 so they eliminated all of those upper channels there uh, later as part of the digital switchover in 2011 the FCC cut it down again and this time they made channel 51 the highest. So again they cut it down from what it was before. So depending on when an antenna is designed it might be designed for different regions here. If you have a really really old antenna on your roof it might be designed for um, you know up through 83 which isn't going to work as efficiently. It'll still work but they're trying to spread the gain out across this larger span of TV channels Whereas if they can focus it down to smaller channel ranges, they can get more gain. They can design a better antenna. So that's why a lot of manufacturers say, 
you know, we, we design antennas for the new HD spec, which doesn't actually mean that it works only with HD channels. It still works with analog signals. What they're saying is we've designed it for this range of channels instead of the previous 14 to 69. Now, for me, I can actually take it a step further. The channels I'm interested in are located in the lower half. I've got 15 through 31 are the channels that I'm interested in. So the channel master I have was actually gen designed for this generation, 14 through 69. Um, a newer one, even if it were designed for this range, um, still wouldn't be as optimized as just 15 through 31. So the, the gray Hooverman antenna design I have is optimized just for this range right here. And by specifically designing it for this range, I can achieve maximum gain over what I care about. And so this is one of the main reasons why I feel I can improve upon uh, the Channel Master design. I wanted to show how I designed and modeled the Gray Hooverman antenna. For that, I used a piece of software called 4NEC2, 4NEC2. And I also used some additional Python scripts to help with the optimizations, both of which I'll include links down below so you can download and play with them. But this is what the gray Hooverman antenna looks like. So the zigzag parts here, if you will, these are the actual elements left and right that pick up the signal. And then right here in the center is where the ballon attaches and then the wire runs off to the TV. And back here, these wires, these are located behind the antenna and these are reflectors and they'll reflect the energy and they basically help focus the antenna so that it gets signal from one direction and blocks signal from behind the antenna. So they definitely help improve gain, although they make it more directional at the same time. So this, this is the software I use to design and model it. Um, I won't go into the operation of 4NEC2 or antenna modeling and designing in general. It took uh, quite a while to learn the ins and outs of how to do that. And there's a lot of things you need to learn. So if you're interested in that, uh, you can read up on it online, but I'm not going to go into the details here. Um, I will post down below <clears throat> a link to a blog where I'll have the actual model file for this antenna so you can download it and play with it yourself. Or if you're interested, you could uh, build one yourself. Again, I will state this antenna is optimized for channels 15 through 31. So if you wish to use it for the full UHF spectrum, it will work, but understand that it is optimized for the lower half. Now, as far as performance goes, so this is what the predicted um, result will be from the antenna. So these two lines up top here use this axis over here and this is the gain of the antenna. And the two lines, the difference between them, so the top gray line is the raw gain of the antenna, and that's like the theoretical maximum that it'll pick up at any given frequency. And then the black line, that's the net gain, and at some frequencies there'll be losses in the antenna, and when you account for those losses, you know, this, the black line, this is effectively what you're going to get. So that's, that's the more important of the lines. And you can see here, so gain increases, 12s, 13s, all the way up to almost 14. And then it starts to taper off. And then right in here is channel 31 where I designed it. And you can clearly see that the gain drops off after that. Now this second line down here, or I should say third line down here, uses these axes over here. And this is the SWR which I'm not going to go into what that means, but basically you want it as low as possible, um, the lowest possible value being 1. And so this is the SWR curve, and you can see it's pretty low. For the most part, it hugs 1 down there and starts to come up about the point where the antenna drops off. So this is actually a very good SWR curve and pretty good gain curves. So the theory is, or in theory, this antenna should perform very well. Now. I'm curious to compare this to the Channel Master antenna, and here's a plot of how the Channel Master 4-bay antenna should perform. Um, as you can see, the gain in the lower half of UHF is much lower, and it goes up. But ultimately, it does go higher all the way up to into the 14s, so the, up here the gain is higher, but in the low UHF, 
the gain is definitely lower. And as far as the SWR curve goes, you can see that it is much higher in the fives and whatnot, and then it tapers down close to one as you get into the upper range. So clearly the Channel Master 4 bay is designed for the upper half of the UHF, whereas the antenna I'm going for is designed for the lower half, and so that's why I feel it's going to perform better. To construct the antenna, I'll be using these raw materials. Um, we've got all aluminum and some plastic. Um, so we've got some one inch by one inch aluminum tubing, and this will be used for all of the structure of the antenna. And then we've got some aluminum, aluminum rods, which will be the actual elements of the antenna. And the aluminum itself, I feel it's pretty easy to get a hold of and relatively uh, inexpensive. Um, most of this stuff, if you go to like Home Depot or Lowe's, most of them have a small section in the hardware department where they carry certain sizes of aluminum stock like this. And so for example, like this eight foot long piece of aluminum here was at like $15, which this is more than enough than I'll need for the antenna. So, you know, it's actually less than that cost wise, but um, most Home Depots and Lowe's will carry something like this. If they don't, uh, if you live in a medium to large sized city, most uh, the times they'll have a, a steel supply shop that sells structural steel for buildings and projects and whatnot. And most, but not all, steel supply stores will carry limited aluminum stock. So you can check places like that. And if you have a hard time finding it anywhere, you can always go online. Uh, some of these longer, uh, thin aluminum pieces. These came up from onlinemetals.com and they were pretty cheap. I mean these are six feet long at an eighth of an inch diameter and these were I think a dollar seventy each. So pretty cheap. So all in all the the aluminum for this antenna is going to run probably twenty thirty dollars not that much especially when you consider a commercial antenna usually costs fifty sixty eighty dollars or more. So, you know, you, you still have a savings even by using high quality materials. And then the next part here for the insulating part. So this is a sheet of raw plastic. Um, this here is called very high density or very high molecular weight um, nylon, it's a VHMW. And the, the previous antenna I constructed, I actually used something called ultra high molecular weight UHMW nylon. And either way, it's basically, it's a very dense nylon or dense plastic that is, obviously it's plastic so it doesn't conduct electricity. It's easy to cut, easy to drill, easy to machine. And it's also very resistant to uh, like temperature and weather and whatnot. So it makes a great plastic for use outside. Now this particular one is one inch by three quarters of an inch by three feet long. And this stuff can be a little more expensive. This is probably actually the most expensive part of the antenna. Um, I had to get this online from a place called TAP Plastics, T-A-P Plastics. And this one piece here I believe was $15. Uh, if you have a really good like hobby supply store in your area, you might be able to find this, but I've never found it in a store. Pretty much got to get it online. Um, I would have gone with the ultra high molecular weight plastic that I used last time, but I had a hard time finding it at a reasonable price, so I went with the very high molecular weight. So um, we'll see how that works out compared to the previous antenna. And then the last bit of hardware is just various bits of uh, stainless steel screws to assemble it all together, screws, nuts, and washers. So this is the raw materials, and next is to measure, cut, drill, and assemble it all together. Here briefly is how I drill through metal. So first off, I have a drill press, which makes this a lot easier. You could do it with a hand drill, but it would be a lot easier if you have access to a drill press. Uh, secondly, always secure your work to the table. Don't try and hold metal when you're drilling it. You can do that with wood sometimes, but with metal you don't want to do it. If you've never drilled through metal, when the drill bit gets close to going through the metal, a lot of times it'll grab it and sometimes it'll start spinning the metal on the drill bit, which could cut your fingers easily. 
Uh, so definitely secure it to the table. And then when you're drilling through metal, and now aluminum's a lot softer than steel or a lot of other metals, so it's pretty easy to go through, but you still want some sort of lubrication. They sell specialized uh, lubricates for this, but I just use a Q-tip with some vegetable oil on it and just put a drop on there like that. And then as you drill the vegetable oil, it'll do two things. It'll one, lubricate the drill bit, and two, it'll also help pull heat away to keep it from getting too hot. So, now as you're drilling, you want to go slow. There's, there's no reward for getting it done quickly. And then you want to back it out occasionally to get the shavings off and also keep it from getting too warm. And there we go. So the other thing I should mention, when you're drilling metal, whether you're doing using a drill press or a hand drill, you want to do it on the slowest speed you can. You don't want to go fast. That's just going to generate heat, which is just going to destroy your drill bit up here. So go nice and slow. Well, I believe I'm done with machining and ready for assembly. So the aluminum rods for the elements have been bent into the appropriate shape. Um, all of the aluminum has been cut to length and the holes drilled in and then for example, where necessary, in addition to the holes, they were tapped in there so that I can drive screws through to assemble it. As far as the plastic goes, so I cut it to the appropriate length and then drilled holes and then drilled a larger diameter hole so the screw can be recessed and then did that on the back side. So all the screws are recessed in there and I've got three of those here. Now when you're working with plastic, whether you're cutting it, drilling it, whatever, um, you want to go slow. You don't want to rush it because you basically you could melt the plastic, but if you drill slowly and if you cut slowly, it's, it's really easy to get through. You just got to go slowly. And then the last bit over here is just uh, the various stainless steel hardware. So yeah, I think I'm at the point where I'm ready to assemble. Well, here's what the fully assembled antenna looks like. If you come in here, you can see we've got the elements all bent here. And this is just one continuous rod all the way across, same on the other side. And then here are those plastic fittings that I machine with recessed screws. And then for here, there's a recessed hole underneath, comes up, and then there's a washer to secure it. And then a nylon lock nut so that it doesn't come undone. And in the middle here, where the ballon will connect, instead of a nylon walk nut, I went with wing nuts so that it can easily be attached. And then, so there are some aluminum standoffs, if you will, to attach the reflector rod back here. Now, as far as the reflectors go, so these are larger diameter, these are one quarter inch, and I drilled holes you know, all the way straight through the boom. And I wasn't sure if I needed to do anything to keep them in there um, or if they would move around. And when I put them through, um, some of them, most of them, were very secure in place. It was a very tight fit, and I had to pound them in, and there's no way they're moving. But a couple of them were very loose in their hole and would slide around. So what I ended up doing, you can see right there, um, both sides, um, I just ran a bead of epoxy around there to hold it in place just so it doesn't come loose in time with you know weathering and whatnot so that should hold everything in place nicely so yeah I have some plastic caps to stick into the end of the boom here on both sides to keep everything nice and watertight and everything so all the screws are attached with uh, Loctite and also these plastic fittings here to this boom, um, I put some epoxy under here just so everything is nice and tight. There's not going to be any problems with weather issues here. So, and definitely owing to its construction, it is very light for its size. I haven't weighed it yet, but I would say two to three pounds. So, 
Next step is attach the bow in and put it up on the mast and see how it compares. Now that the antenna is constructed, the question is, how does it actually perform? So what I did is I used my existing Channel Master CM4221, which is the four bay antenna, and then also the gray Hooverman antenna, and I mounted each in the exact same location, and then I used my television to scan the different channels and wrote down the actual signal strength for each channel so we could do a, a direct comparison. Now my TV reports two different numbers for each channel. First is the overall signal strength and that's 0 to 100 percent. And then the second number it actually reports is a signal to noise ratio in decibels. And both numbers, obviously higher is better. So that allows us to compare these two. <clears throat> so for channel 15, which channel 15 in this area is extremely strong. It's like a thousand kilowatt broadcast, very close. You literally could just stick a, any wire outside and it'll pick it up or inside for that matter. But so for the first channel, um, both antennas picked it up. The TV reported 98%, which I think is the highest it goes. I don't think the TV's never actually reported 100%, so I think 98% is considered the most. Um, as far as the signal to noise ratio, you can see the gray Hooverman got one decibel higher. So that's a slight win for the homemade antenna. Channel 16, you can see they're very similar again, both 89%, but one decibel higher on the signal to noise ratio. So again, slightly higher for the homemade. Uh, channel 19, uh, both of them were very low, anything below 60% and the TV can't lock onto the signal reliably. So, you know, they, the channel master was listed higher here, but both were very intermittent, frequent dropouts. Um, neither were watchable, really. So, um, the 56 was just the highest reported with the channel master. 43% was the highest I saw with the, the gray Hooverman. So, really, both antennas kind of failed here, but... Um, that's expected. That's the one hard channel to receive in this area. Uh, channel 24, you can see the Gray Hooverman got higher percentage as well as uh, signal to noise ratio. Channel 31, which is the upper end of what I designed the antenna for, they both matched up perfectly there. So, channel 34 here, this is actually beyond what I designed the antenna for, but you can see the gray Hooverman uh, surpassed the channel master. It still produced more gain and higher signal to noise ratio. Uh, channel 41, much to my surprise, is still higher than the channel master one, 89% uh, versus 87%. And then channel 50, which is definitely beyond what it was designed for, um, both got 98% and a slightly higher signal to noise ratio on the channel master antenna. So all in all, very pleased with the results for this antenna. It uh, meet or exceeded the channel master on everything up until you get into the really high UHF range. So definitely very pleased with this antenna and I will be using this one for a long time. Thanks for watching.